All right, guys, uh, back again. Take a see if we can take another couple stabs at this uh, Isaiah 62. Um, <clears throat> switched over to the New King James version. Uh, I can look up uh, words better on this one. So, um, but anyway, uh, so we made it to uh, to six. And uh, next verse is, I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. They shall never hold their peace day or night. You who make mention of the Lord, do not keep silent. So what we see in that is there are watchmen that are on the walls of the city. Um, remember, you got to think beyond just uh, describing some random point in history or something like that. Uh, the meaning behind it. There's a deeper meaning, right? So since you see these watchmen on the walls, they're like the watchers. They're literally uh, watching to see what comes in or out of the city. And again, they shall never hold their peace day or night. Remember, uh, Jerusalem <clears throat> is the city that we're trying to dwell in. Uh, that's the... Uh, um, the, the city that we you actually want to be a city. When it talks about the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven and, and a temple, you are that temple. So when it speaks of Jerusalem, and it says they shall never hold their peace day or night. That's to say that these watchmen are representative of, um, again, remember, the sun is going to marry the land. And you know, make make the bride. So these watchmen represent because they're day and night. These two pillars of God, watching, judging what it is that we do, with regards to that city. Okay, and they will never hold their peace. P e a c e, day or night. In other words, constant judgment uh, on that city. You who make mention of the Lord, do not keep silent. Um, let me see if it says anything different in this one. Because this is actually the... Uh, this is the ESV, so it, it reads a little bit kinder than the, uh, than the, the James. But uh, on your walls, O Jerusalem, I have set watchmen all the day and all the night. They never or they shall never be silent. You who put the Lord in remembrance, take no rest. So in other words, you're working for the Lord. Don't be don't be thinking that you're not being watched at all times. Uh, by the by the gates to that city um, verse 7 and give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes it a praise in the earth so again building this place um, uh, it just seems like simple to me and uh, but maybe even hard to explain though um, and give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and make it a praise in the earth so to build it to kind always to pursue to uh, to be that city to be part of that city um, to be a, a temple and a place and a people worthy to be sought and, and worshipped, right, for God's glory. Um, verse 8, The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by his mighty arm. Remember, righteous right hand. I, I will not again give your grain to be food for your enemies. And foreigners shall not drink your wine for which you have labored. And a lot of people think that that is just automatically assuming like some kind of protection. 
But again, this is God's law and judgment. Um, this restoration is when we understand what God that God's working through these two uh, pillars, the two promises, right? He works through day and night. And when it says, I will again, I will not again give your grain to be food for your enemies. So uh, our grain is what we produce. To be food for our enemies is to be dishonoring to God. You're, you're feeding your enemy to... Uh, you're you're uh, dishonoring God by not knowing that everything that God does is used potentially for good. Um, so as to say that the judgments that would typically, I, I guess the best uh, example would be like in Joseph's case, where Joseph knew that bad could be used for good. Um, it would be as to say, um, and actually though he was, uh, he was leaning up corn sheets, wasn't he? Um, so it would be to say that uh, when we become obedient and we're striving to honor God, we won't give our enemies cause to judge us, right? To be food for our enemies. And foreigners shall not drink your wine for which you have labored. That's to say that, um, remember uh, when it says, do not harm the oil or the wine. Uh, the wine is actually the fruit of, of uh, God's pressing. Uh, when, they, when you think of like grapes of wrath and old wine and new wine, uh, these are, the wine represents um, the, the results of what comes from God's acting upon you to form you, to judge you, crush you, to, to make you what you could be. So that's the wine. And, and foreigners shall not drink your wine for which you have labored. In other words, in, in you working in that vineyard and reaping the harvest, you're, you're going to harvest whatever it is that you sow. So when you're working in that vineyard, other again, foreigners are not going to be able to use that against you. What Whatever wine comes in your cup will be yours. Um, but those who garner it shall eat it and praise the Lord, and those who gather it shall drink it in the courts of my sanctuary. So those who garner it shall eat it. Let me see if I can... Let me see how that word is used. But those who gather it shall eat it and praise the Lord. Those who have brought it together shall drink it in my holy courts. So, uh, again, reap what you sow. If you've, if you've gathered it, it's yours. You deserve whatever it is that God is going to give you. Um, those who have brought it together shall drink it in my holy courts. Um, whatever you've done in God's name, he fills your cup with, okay? Um, go through, go through the gates, prepare the way for the people. Build up, build up the highway, clear it of stones, lift up a signal over the peoples. And... Uh, this version says, go through, go through the gates, prepare the way for the people, build up, build up the highway, take out the stones, lift up a banner for the peoples. So this is to prepare a way for other people that they could know God too. In other words, you're not going by yourself. You're uh, doing the work of bringing people with you. You're, you're clearing the way of stones. Uh, make straight the way for the Lord, right? Um, that other people can come along with you. And you do that by not judging people, um, by allowing God to be that judge, 
and to impart the idea that there's a restoration that needs to take place, that marriage ceremony that we're looking for, um, that there would be fellowship between all people, that, that Israel would be a blessing to the people instead of maybe um, a burden and a law and overbearing. Uh, remember, God wants to write the laws on our hearts. So uh, following God's law should become instinctive at some point. It, it shouldn't be a uh, coming out of a rule book, right? Um, it's not what was intended for us. Laws are, the laws are good, and they're given for a reason, but they're also taught to teach us things. Um, not muzzling an ox, for instance, as it treads out the grain. Um, it's working to create the grain, and you should be able to enjoy and gain sustenance from your work. It's how your spirit is empowered, and then the work is not a burden. The work is actually the reward, because... As you're treading the grain, it's producing your food. Uh, to muzzle the ox is also to, you know, you're stopping that word from going forward. Um, the, the ox and the donkey are two different sides of God's law. Uh, the ox is plowing with strength and pulling always forward. Uh, the donkey, beast of burden, um, has the purpose but uh, the donkey is the uh, gives milk, like donkeys provided milk. So it's kind of like hard, solid food versus learning. It would be equated to walking in the light, um, the ox, knowing its master, where the donkey knows its master's crib. The crib is where the children are born. And that is uh, sons and daughters. The sons and daughters are the offspring of the Spirit, right? Sons would be uh, good, obedient to the Spirit. You know, sons of the command, bar mitzvah, sons of man that have repented, and sons of God, all good. Female, more seeds. When it knows what the crib is, is to say that it understands that, or you understand that, and then you're doing the appropriate thing. Uh, when you understand that, though, I would hope that you would then be repentant and plowing forward. The understanding actually comes more towards people who don't know. They, they lack the wisdom. And so as they're stumbling, uh, and God is using that fire, and they're walking in darkness, is using that fire to refine them, uh, to burn off what's bad and to, to let them keep what's good, you're guiding them at the same time. You're, you're plowing, but you're also maybe pulling a cart behind you with, with uh, those that you're trying to take with you, right? Just pave a way for the peoples. Uh, verse 11, Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth, <clears throat> Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him. Sound familiar? And his recompense before him. Um, let me look up that word recompense. How do they put that? Uh, Indeed, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the world, say to the daughter of Zion, surely your salvation is coming. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. Um, there's, uh, in Scripture, it says that God has uh, laid out our good works before us. Um, this is to say that God's already spoken. His, his law is already laid out, blessing and curse. Um, uh, what he will do is already spoken. So there's no mystery. There's no confusion to be involved there. You're, it's, it's all, um, the good works, I guess, is the best way to, to think of that, and his work before him. <clears throat> Plowing ahead, obedient, born of an ox, right? Um, to 
the, the ox should not kick the goads. It should not be worried about what's behind him. That's just following along kind of thing. Uh, you're, you're headed in the direction, eyes focused on God, moving and traveling towards God. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's about it. Uh, and then, uh, and they shall be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. Remember, everything gets redeemed. When, when the 24 elders uh, in the book of Revelation are redeeming, you know, the, the redeemed of the earth, it doesn't mean just like people of the planet, the people of the earth. We are dust. Dust we are and dust, will to, you know, that's what we're going to return to. But our soul is what counts. And the redemption process is God justifying and sanctifying what he has made and created. And that's everything. That's in Isaiah 45, 7. And you shall be called sought out, a city not forsaken. This whole marriage process means that everything counts. Okay? When, when sin is uh, removed... Is the sin removed, or is it justified for the work that it actually does? Like when God gives them over to their sin, is he? When, how? If God gave you over to your sin, is he forsaking you? No, he's just teaching you in the only way that you'll learn. So when it says, uh, "And you shall be called sought out," in other words, he's pursuing you, coming after you, to to redeem you. Uh, faithful wounds, suffering servants, and so on. A city not forsaken. All right. That's 62. Um, you know, I want to say that one of the uh, rabbis was actually mentioning uh, Hebrews. And I, I was listening to Hebrews, and it just blew me away. Because he's like, this is an abomination to all of Judaism. It just blew it all full of holes and said it was like one of the most tragic things ever, you know, ever published, written, uh, whatever. And I think that that's going to be the, what I'm going to get into next because, uh, I listened to it and what was very interesting was in Hebrews, it talks about how God swore by himself or, you know, uh, swore with himself, right? He, he swore by himself, not, I guess it would be by himself, because, but he, he swore, and it t speaks of um, the two things that cannot change, and immediately, immediately, all I could think of was um, Genesis. Again, Isaiah 45, 7, God creates darkness and evil, but he also forms and makes light and peace. When man was created, we see these two uh, two instances of man's appearing. I, I'm careful not to say created, because one's created, one's formed. And so we see these two things. God is created, or I mean, I'm, sorry, man is created um, in one instance, by God, and then man is formed in the other instance by Lord God. This is the us in Genesis that is spoken of. These are this is how he swears by himself, because these two uh, judgments, if you will, uh, the blessing and the curse, they're both judgments. One is a judgment as a reward. You know, your works are judged and you're rewarded for good works. And then the other one is a judgment in that you um, you are judged for those works and receive a curse. The wages of what you earn are, are based off of, you know, what it is that you do. So, anyway, I hope this helps. Let me get this loaded up there. I love you guys. Shalom.